What's up, everybody? This is Supreme Decisions, and today I'm coming to you with the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Now, I go into a lot of different things, and the podcast is generally for... I I, I do a lot of things that I call for the police apologists. But it's also to give you a deeper insight to the teachings that I give you. Because it's all it's like the detail or the context behind the things that you're seeing on YouTube as far as the court cases and the point in not only how, the when, but in which you are applying these cases to. Now, today I'm going to give you something from a kind of a lead-in perspective because I want to give you an idea of something because a lot of people have a misconception of what it is our system is in itself. Well, I'm going to take a moment though prior to doing that is I'm thinking about setting up another type of podcast where it's going to be like the Brown Liquor Hour where I give you something straight because I'm a Tennessee whiskey drinker. And today, my whiskey of choice is Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select. It's basically in Lynchburg. And it's delicious. Mm. 47% alcohol. And it is, it's one of my favorites. And I actually drink it straight out my little whiskey glass. Well, I have several of them, but. That's the one I'm using today. But here's where I want to kind of get into today's topic. Um, our actual policing system slash prison system. Now, I'm going to give you, again, context. The United States has 5% of the world's population, yet it has 25% of the world's criminals. I'm going to say that one more one more time because I want you again to get context. We have 5% of the world's population. That means 95% of the people, others that are on the planet, do not live in the United States. Minuscule. Yet, we have 25% of the world's criminal. Or, I hate to use that context or term. We have 25% of the world's incarcerated. So out of 95%, we're taking a good 25% of that as incarcerated individuals from a 5% world nation. Now, this number, I actually, I'm going to go back because, again, I did a, um, did a podcast I want to say about two years ago, and these are the numbers that are based on 2022. At the time of 2022, we had 2.3 million incarcerated individuals. It was the highest rate of incarceration in the world per country. Because again, 95% of the world's population is not in the United States. And what do we attribute that to? We attribute it to the word I use constantly, which is profitability. How? By privatizing the prisons. Because even Michael Jordan had to go through a little bit of guff because there's a Michael Jordan that's on a prison board that is privatizing prison all over this country. Now, why are we doing that? Because it's done on a, what I call a hotel leasing system. These individuals are building prisons at a faster rate than they are building schools. Let that sink in. They are now criminalizing children as far down as second grade. And at this rate, they are they're giving tax breaks they're adding jobs to the highly unqualified 
and they're removing governmental interaction from the prisoning system. They are then passing on the bill, so to speak, to the prisoners. But how do they get these prisoners? I've said it before. I spoke about police quotas. I spoke about the criminalization of life. That's literally one of the first videos I did seven years ago. When you're talking about why and how, this is why. It is done for revenue. Because most people don't even understand we have almost a 70% incarcerated individuals simply because they can't make bail. I'm saying that again. They're there because they can't make bail. Not that they're guilty of something, but because they were charged and can't make bail. So therefore, they're sitting in these jails. They're sitting in our incarceration system for profit. Because even like hotels, they are incentivized not only to have these uh, beds for the most part, but there has to be a certain occupancy rate. Just to give you kind of an idea. A lot of people don't know or didn't know that Tyler Perry used a wing of the Forest Park um, Detention Center in Atlanta when he did Medea's Go Medea Goes to Jail. He was able to do that because he had a few extra thousand dollars left from a Medea play. And Forest Park's jail had just been open so it was not full to occupancy they had a less than desirable occupancy rate so he was allowed to pay them to use a portion of that jail for his actual movie so yes that was an actual jail that was in forest park that was in atlanta because what they're doing is incentivizing profitability because they're criminalizing life. Now, one of the things that we're going to go into today is the 13th Amendment and the context of no voluntary or involuntary servitude in it. That's slavery. You know, just to, I guess to put it nicely, that is absolute slavery. So that is actually illegal when it comes to our United States Constitution. But there's an exception, and that exception is punishment. But what I just say about those that are being punished, they have yet to be convicted. Now I want you to understand that. You have people that are sitting in our prison system they have yet to be convicted, and they're there simply for profit. Because even one of my favorite rappers, he's my son, the general my son. He stated, they, they use you for cheap labor. They don't call you slave no more. They call you criminal. Because the abolishing of slavery on September 22nd, 1862, was the attack of Southern capitalism. Why? Because slavery was the very infrastructure of the South. Ending slavery left the Southern economy in shambles. So when we're looking at it, why did we go to privatized prisons for profitability? Because we then had to come up with something because we had 4 million people that were at one point property that are no longer property but we still have to have a system that thrives. I'm gonna say that one more time because again, most people don't understand the context behind a lot of the things that are said or even understand some of the things that are being said or saying by those that actually wanna support this. So when we have things such as the Jim Crow laws, 
That was the making illegal ordinary life actions. In our current prisoning system and policing system was born September 22nd, 1862. Now, I'm going to expound on this in a second or with a second podcast or video because I'm going to show you how the numbers are not as they seem. I'm going to say that one more time. I'm going to show you how the numbers are not how they seem. Because those four million people that were formerly property began being arrested in masses. That was the beginning of the creation of the Frankenstein monster as we know it today. Because again, the monster wasn't a monster because of how it looked. It was a monster because of how it was treated and how people perceived it. I want you to understand that. The creation, Frankenstein was the creator. Right? And in this instance, our policing system was the creator of criminalizing minorities and creating Frankenstein's monster by treating them less than human. By incarcerating them for ordinary, everyday life actions. Those that were considered black were sent to prison and even executed for ideas not actual criminality for instance the lie that carol bryan um donham that resulted in the murder of a child y'all remember that you actually probably don't even remember carol and bryan dunham the lie that she told that resulted in the murder of a child Emmett Till. Whoops. I, I, I didn't mean to slip that in there. Because remember, the prosecutor stated that, that Carolyn Bryant Dunham should not go to prison even though she confessed to a crime because she was too old. Yet they had no issue throwing Bill Cosby in prison for the same, and they were the same age. I'm going to say that one more time. Carolyn Bryant Dunham was accessory to a murder. But she couldn't go to jail because she was too old. At the same time, Bill Cosby went to prison and he was the same age. Did not kill anyone. Did not take anyone's life. Now, I want you to let that sink in because, again, we're talking about misnomers in this, in this situation. And I'm going to revisit that because, again, we talk about the prosecutorial discretion. The prosecutor choosing who they're going to prosecute. The prosecutor choosing who's going to jail and who's not. Selective choice. The police officer choosing who they're going to arrest. The police officer choosing who they're going to apply the law to. Choice. Now, but again, like I said, I'm going to revisit that. In 1924, the Democratic Convention had a minimum of 350 delegates in office that were known members of the Ku Klux Klan. more selection but you have been convinced to just vote for them because they're the only ones helping you stay a slave I'm gonna say that one more time hey, I, I, and, and you know I'm actually gonna clear that one up too because in 1924 the Democratic Convention had a minimum of 350 delegates in office that were known members of the Ku Klux Klan but if you are, as, as, as my boy said, you're not black if you're not voting for, for Biden, right? That's, that's what he said. But you've been convinced to vote Democrat because they are the only ones helping you. 
stay a slave. Because I actually put up a post a couple weeks ago that says it's no sense arguing with someone who has convinced their slave master is bringing them comfort. Because they took away your ability to think, see, or believe. They want you to understand that, because even, even in another video I did, someone that keeps feeding you is because they don't want you to ever feed yourself. So they seem like they're actually helping you when the help is actually keeping you exactly where you are. So whenever someone else gives you something different, you know, your freedom of choice, your ability to examine your life and decide not a party, but a person is going to act in your best interest and speak to the issues that are in your heart. Not just binding you to a vote just because you are with that gang. Because even, even when we talk about this, because I'm going to get back on track. I'm pretty sure a lot of people that are listening to me, you probably remember when Hillary Clinton, you know, she was burnt, referring to young black men as super predators. That was the code word then. Joe Biden is actually on record while in Delaware using the N-word on TV on the floor of Congress. Now, I, I want you to let that sink in. Because they don't call you slave no more. They call you criminal. They're telling you what you need to do instead of you listening to who's doing it for you. Because even myself, in 2008, I worked on Barack Obama's um, political campaign in Georgia. 2012, I did not vote for Barack Obama. I voted for myself. Why? Because he no longer had the same values and interests that I needed in my life at that time. So I could not align myself with him. Did that mean that I didn't like him? No, he's a good person. But it had nothing to do with the voting, the ideals, my ability to think and decide what was good for me. But these were the things that they are attempting to take away from you. These are the things that most people are missing now because they're missing the code words. They're missing the ideas that are being set in front of you. They don't allow you to see our system, where it originates from, and where it's going. Because they used, back in my day, phrases like, the war on crime, the war on drugs, because even Tupac told you, the war on crime was a war on you and me. Hashtag the poor. And you've been hearing me say that for years. There's not a war on crime. There's not a war on drugs. There's a war on the poor, which is why there are so many incarcerated out that 2.3 million simply because they can't make bail. Because in this country, 75% of people live below the poverty level, so which means they're living paycheck to paycheck. So if you now go to jail, you're going to miss a bill, you're going to miss a rent, you're going to miss something. Because you're living paycheck to paycheck. Yes, 75%. And that's by design. So that war is on the poor. That's how they restructured it. Because again, now you're seeing, while it's more prevalent where the video cameras are, where the news is speaking about, you're seeing that it's not only on dark skin it's on those that can't afford anything else president richard nixon admitted as much through his advisor john i believe is l litchman 
Ellerchman on a nationwide television broadcast. In 1994, Bill Clinton passed the federal crime bill with mandatory minimums and incentivized law enforcement for arrest. I'm going to say that one more time because I'm going to let you let y'all catch that. In 1994, Bill Clinton passed the federal crime bill with mandatory minimums and incentivized law enforcement for arrest because you, you heard me say before because there are a lot of people that argue with me, police officers are not incentivized for arresting people. Why would they then criminalize life for a profitable system of incarceration? Because they're incentivized to do so by the federal government. They're incentivized by the people that they're that are telling you that they're helping you. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute because there are going to be a lot of people that miss that one. Because even when I spoke about quotas, there's an incentivization for quotas. Remember, I spoke about it a few years ago. People, people put in the comments, oh, there's no sir. police officers don't have quotas. Please, oh, and I, I actually stated that, no, they don't call them quotas because that will make it wrong. But then Trevor Noah put, put out a video about it. And then he lost his show. Amber Ruffin put off a video called Copaganda. YouTube deleted it and she lost her show. Why why are we why are we going through because again the incentivization of the hotel model for policing the poor and criminalizing life is why our system is in the means in which it is today. And with the country firmly in the hand of the clans, laws were passed to criminalize life. If you were perceived as black, such as segregation, Jim Crow laws in the South. Examples are still alive and well in 2024. Just take a drive down through Georgetown and go to Myr Myrtle Beach. In Georgetown, not the one in D.C. I'm talking about the one in Georgetown, South Carolina. And there's a little town right outside of Georgetown, before you get to Myrtle Beach. And they have this beautiful sign that's on the front door. And it reads, whites only. Hanging in the window of this tiny restaurant. Go to almost any city in Alabama. South Georgia. Pick a city. Like True County. Go to Pickens County. Spend too much time in Savannah and see what happens. Cause even Atlanta, Outcast said you come on vacation, leave on probation. It's not is not a joke. It's not just a song lyric. A lot of times when someone is speaking like this. Most people just turn off because these are the harsh realities of our current system. These are the realities and the means in which why I'm teaching the things I am teaching because, believe it or not, the people that are enforcing these to go to jail, go to prison, put you in front of judges that are choosing with prosecutors that are choosing with police officers that are choosing and with defense attorneys that are not fighting for you. Remember the Tommy Sotomayor question? Go listen to that podcast. Because our prison has become a hotel model where they must keep these prisons full. Because even when Donald Trump did his prison reform, 2.3 million, oh my God. It helped less than a tenth of percent of people. It helped less than 2,300 people. 2.3 million people are incarcerated. 
his bill helped 2300 because it's not designed for people to not be there. They are incentivized since 1994 to keep these private prisons full. They're given quotas that they must ticket, they must put on probation, they must lock up through their choices. And they choose who they do that to. If you don't believe so, remember I talked about the Beverly Hills police officers. Their first 100 arrests. Now keep in mind, Beverly Hills is going to be 90% Caucasian. Their first 100 arrests was one Spanish-speaking gentleman and 99 people that are considered black or perceived as black. Let that sink in. One Spanish-speaking male and 99 people that were perceived as black in an area where 90% of the population is white. Yes, I pause for dramatic effect because I want you to think about that. These police officers are choosing who they believe are criminals. They are choosing who they are arresting. Because even in New York, a lot of people brought up, well, you know, they, they, they only pick out certain individuals and they accidentally have these, these encounters with them because you know how they're dressed. Okay, cool. Did we talk about Shefalosha, who's an NBA player, who had his leg broken while in a shirt and tie? Matter of fact, he was in a suit coming out a high-end hotel where two New York police officers broke his leg because they thought he was someone else. They didn't know he was a basketball player. Or because they made a choice in the selective thinking and the imprint of who they are believed to show as criminal. The entire system as we know it is completely shut down if everyone demands a trial because I actually did uh, uh, one of my favorite shows, Denzel Washington. He did a show, I believe it was Roman J. Israel Esquire. He speaks about 95% of cases never go to trial. So that means less than 5% of all people charged with a criminal offense don't go to trial. Yet the 5% that do go to trial, 76% of those people win. Why? Because the people that are choosing don't know how to follow law. They don't even know what the law is. The officers that are arresting, they don't know what law is. They don't know how to detect. They don't know how to solve a crime. They don't even know what a crime is 90% of the time because they got them as trained attack dogs. They got the people that don't ask questions because they are lower IQ people. The people that are more prone to aggression. Always understand that. When you do something as simple as say, I want a jury trial. The power that you speak becomes deafening. My nephew was charged with murder. I chose to start representing him. The first demand was for a jury trial. 10 days later, he was exonerated from murder charges. Let that sink in. He was sitting in jail for almost a year. His public pretender was not fighting for him. I took over his case and in 10 days, the murder charges were dropped because 
He simply demanded a trial. If that 5% doubles to 10%. Now keep in mind, we, we use the, the excuse of COVID. COVID shut down the courting, court system, so it backed it up months. We're backed up months. We, we just got to let them sit. What happens now when we have add another 5% to that? And then we start using their rules against them, such as demanding a speedy trial. Demanding, since they're making the choice to actually have evidence or we now hold them accountable for their choices. And last time I checked, 76 is real close to 100 versus 24. They're only winning 24% of trials. That's why they don't want to go. They're putting up baseball numbers. Just want you to understand, an at-bat, they're hitting one out of every five. You're winning three out of every four. They're going to hit, they're going to win one out of five. You're going to win three out of four. I think your odds are a lot better than theirs. I got charged with 108 counts of RICO for doing the idea of having people say, you know what, I want a jury trial in Gwinnett County and in Fulton County. They don't want to be challenged. They just want the profit. They just want the money. They actually put, all I want is money. Fuck the fame. I'm a simple man. They want it to be convenient. It's become profitable to offer you that convenience. Just pay it online. Use your credit card. You don't even have to come in. They want you to believe that they have an authority, even though you are the most powerful person. They're becoming profitable to offer you fear. They'll double up the charges. They'll just pile on charges because, again, 108 charges, 20 years per count. They're promoting profit through false superiority. What I mean by that? The judge is elected by the people. The prosecutor represents the people. The public defender also represents the people. Police officer has a fiduciary duty to the people. Guess who you are? The people. These are the things in which I'm bringing to your, your attention. It may not be comfortable to hear these things. You may have to listen to this podcast a couple times to even find out exactly where I went with this. But it's about opening your eyes, paying attention to what's being presented to you, and then knowing, standing on your own, making a conscious decision to move forward against those that say that they're bigger than you, they're stronger than you, they're faster than you, they can harm you in any way they like. You use their rules against them. Don't take someone else's ideas and make them yours unless you want them to be yours. When you're sitting up here and you're going through this and you're understanding that we're here and I have pieces to a game, what game am I playing? We're understanding that there are certain aspects of life that you have to pay attention to. And one of those is knowing. Because G.I. Joe used to say, knowing is half the battle. Understanding how each aspect of the game works is part of that game. Because just having pieces doesn't make you successful. 
but being able to know what those pieces do and how to move and maneuver with those pieces and through those pieces to make them most effective for you is how the game is won. And this is Supreme. Until next time, I'm out.